Campaign 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Wisconsin Eye is on the campus of Gateway Technical College in Sturdivant. Randy Bryce of Caledonia is a Democrat running in the 1st Congressional District. Randy, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, uh, thank you for the uh, short interview at the convention that kind of introduced yourself. So now let's get, us, get, get into some issues. Okay. Top issue in your race? Uh, Health care. That's one of the, the main reasons I got in here. At the time, Paul Ryan was talking about repealing and replacing Obamacare, and that was something I was going to affect 23 million Americans. Myself, I'm a cancer survivor. I was diagnosed at a time in my life when I didn't have insurance. Um, very scary. My mom has MS, and my dad has Alzheimer's. So um, it, it's a huge issue. It's something that's going to affect everybody from you know being born until until you get older in life, and making sure that people. I, I've been in favor of Medicare for all solution. Um, because what good is health care coverage if it's too expensive to use? And, and also an issue with, with drug prices. You know, 92% of Americans feel that the government should be able to negotiate prices. And that's, that's another issue that we're having, too, people being able to afford their medications. If you're a Democrat in the U.S. House, looking at two more years with President Trump in office, how do you take st steps towards Medicare for all? Well, people are, are catching on what you, what you explain to them, what it actually involves. Um, and especially looking at it from an economic standpoint too. It's actually a, a really good job creator um, when you look at it in the full context of the issue. Uh, we had a company, an entire company, GE, moved from Waukesha to Canada and we heard Paul Ryan discussing, well, it's, it's because of the tax rate that they have up there. Well, no, one thing that Canada has that we don't have in the United States to make us as competitive is universal health care. Okay. Um, the current debate nationally, uh, internationally, over immigration. Um, talk to me about your plan for uh, the DACA, the Dreamers, and the 13 million, whatever the number is here illegally, please, the changes you'd like to see made. Well, we need to immediately get a Clean Dream Act passed. This is something that we've been promising them. And these are people that, this is the only home that they know. We're talking about younger Americans that were brought here through no choice of their own. Uh, their parents brought them here, and, and now they're getting older, um, and, and they would have been fine if Donald Trump just would have left that program alone that they'd still be covered, they'd be able to be here legally. Um, but he decided to start using them as bargaining chips. And I, I find that really, um, really appalling, um, especially, you know, and especially when he starts comparing them with like MS-13. The, the reason, the, one of the ways that you stay on the, uh, to be considered a dreamer is that you don't have any criminal record whatsoever. Um, you also need to be employed or, or attending school. Um, I'm also in favor of pressing a, of, uh, pressing for a DAPA Act, which would cover not just the younger um, people, but their parents as well, because they've been here for, for long periods of time. And we need to have a, a pathway, a clear and, and quick pathway to full legalization, of making sure that they have the documentation that they need. Um, and another thing that I've been pushing for, and I've been one of the earliest congressional candidates, was to, to abolish ICE. I, I don't see any use for um, you know, they've grown into Donald Trump's personal deportation force. Um, what steps would you take to abolish ICE? Let's, and what would you replace it with? Because you've heard the president say that that would endanger our national security. His okay. words, not mine. Right. No, nothing could be further from the truth. We can, we can um, have, a, have a clear pathway coming in um, without ICE, and that, that's not going to affect, um, you know, people being safe. I, my dad's a retired cop. I'm fully in favor of, of cooperating with local police forces. And this is another part of the reason why I'm, I'm in favor of abolishing ICE is because in the immigrant community, when you mention the word ICE, people right away get, get scared. And I don't, I don't see any reason for having a government agency that people are afraid to call to ask for assistance. Um, you know, and that's going to make them afraid of calling up police officers too if, if somebody's trying to break into their house. They're like, well, no, are they going to send ICE instead? Um, and it's not just a clear, here's one easy solution, because there are several departments within ICE. Um, I have a problem with the, you know, the heavily militarized police force 
um, kicking in doors in the, in the middle of the night. And, uh, and again, Donald Trump likes to compare everybody with MS-13. Well, let's make sure that our, our local police force has the resources that they need to combat that, that criminal, you know, going after gang members. Um, but now ICE is even, they're even going after legalized Americans and detaining, you know, separating legalized people that, people that were born here. Um, and there was just a letter a couple of weeks ago, 19 members of ICE signed, saying, look, the way Donald Trump is using us, we're ineffective and, and we agree that we should be disbanded. What should be the relationship between local police departments, local law enforcement agencies and ICE? Should they be prohibited from cooperating with them? What, 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 what should the ground rules be? Well, I, I've been in favor of, um, of things like sanctuary cities where you just, you know, it's, don't look for a reason to arrest somebody. If they, if they step out of line, they, they uh, have a moving violation, issue them a ticket for that. That's not a reason to, to deport them. I know in, in Racine there was a group that was watching a county sheriff pulling over people just based on, on appearances. And now they can run your license plate even if you're not doing anything illegal. But if it comes back that the person driving doesn't have a valid license, not even the person driving, but whoever the vehicle is registered to, if that person comes back when they run the plate, this person doesn't have a, a you know, valid license, they can pull them over. And uh, I mean, there's no, you don't need any kind of um, you know, crime to be committing in action. They can just, they can pull you over. Once you're pulled over three times without a license, that's the three strikes rule, and you're, you're automatically deported, and you can't come back. Let's go back to your thoughts on um, how do, what should, what, the, what should the process be for uh, DACA, the Dreamers, and those here illegally? What, what, what should the steps be for them to get full citizenship? Should, the, uh, should it be a waiting period? Should they pay uh, some amount of money because they've broken the law? Um, what? What standards? Well, see, if, if they're covered by the DREAM Act right now, they're not breaking any laws, and they are here legally. Right. Um, so but what about those others, those 12 to 13 million that are here illegally that aren't enrolled in DACA? Well, let's, let's look at why, why they're not enrolled in DACA. How do they get here? Um, everyone's going to have different stories, and I, I don't think one blanket is going to cover them all. But are they here? Did they overst overstay their, their visas, which seems to be quite common? Um, at times, and, and if so, you know, let's let's find those people. Let's keep track of people that are that are here. Um, but I don't think you know privatized prisons have a lot to do a lot, a lot to do with this too. We're seeing how much money is being made, especially at our southern borders. Um, and part of the problem too is the fact that they're not keeping track of of who's coming in, of where they're sending the children. There's no you know the a court ordered the Trump administration to reunite these families, and they've asked for an extension on that because they can't keep track of of who they sent where. Um, and just the fact that they're, they're separating families on the southern border is, um, I, you know, I, I've come to a lack of words, have a lack of words to describe how I feel about it. But it's, um, that's not the, the United States that I put on a uniform for. And, and um, I know you've been asked about this before, but let's put it on the record. Your position on President Trump's wall? Oh, I'm, I'm completely against it. Uh, I mean, uh, if you're gonna spend billions of dollars for a wall, that can be climbed over with a, a $50 ladder, I, I find that quite a waste of money. The Trump administration sent Congress a budget for the military for the Pentagon that would significantly increase military spending. I think it would take it to more than $700 billion a year. Uh, do you oppose that increase? I do. Um, being a military veteran myself, I, I know that we have more than enough. Um, our troops are, they have everything. The problem is that we have everything we need while we're in service to the country wearing the uniform, but they don't, there doesn't seem to be anything in place to take care of us once we come back. So I would say let's take some of that money. You know, in addition to the fact that there's hungry kids going to sleep every night in this country, um, the wealthiest country in the world, we can't, you know, but we can afford to, to make more bombs or a better bomb. I'd rather take care of our, our hungry kids here first and let's take care of our veterans because if we can afford to send them to war and have them with all this great equipment, we should be able to take care of them physically and mentally when they come back. Do we need to pull our troops out of Afghanistan? I don't see why we're there. I haven't heard any reason. Well, when, how do we win Afghanistan? We've been there. Now kids are being born these days that don't know the um, United States at peace because we've been at war for so long. It, it's an, a war that's just been dragged on. There's no end strategy, and, and I want to hear one first. Healthcare for veterans, this debate over whether more of it should be taken from the VA and veterans such as yourself should be allowed to see more private physicians. Your position on that? I, I 
don't favor privatization of our VA services. The problem that we're having right now is that it's not being fully funded. And Donald Trump thinks that by keeping money from fully funding it, um, that, that's going to save money when in actuality, not only is it disregarding you know, services that veterans need, um, but there's nothing being done to help us. You know, we have a really good facility here in Milwaukee. Um, one of my last jobs was building a parking structure there. And it's, it, when I worked with homeless veterans too, that was the first job I had when I returned from the service. 60% of our pop, the homeless population at the time was made up of veterans. Um, so there's a lot of work to do here. A lot of vets need services, and, and they're not getting it because the VA is not being fully funded. The president's tariffs on uh, both uh, Canada, Mexico, and now China, and the additional tariffs, position on uh, the orders issue, uh, implementing tariffs. I'm not opposed to the tariffs themselves. Um, you know, the first time, we have to look at, at how Donald Trump is using them. And the first time he imposed tariffs, right away it was, it was set for everybody. Then the next day he said, well, I'm going to take back Canada and Mexico. We'll leave them out of it. Yeah. Then a week, right. Then, he came back. then a week later it was Australia too because they had some things that we traded with. Um, and that just seemed to go, you know, to get flushed away. And now this, ne this most recent round of tariffs just really seems to be stirring a hornet's nest of people that have been our allies for you know, forever that we, we've traded with and, and had fantastic relationships with. Um, I really have a problem with that. If he could come up with an intelligent, long-term, well-thought-out solution, there's a possibility that they could be helpful. But the way he's doing them now, it's, it's pretty much a shoot from the hip type deal with him, where he's, I mean, look at Harley Davidson going after them. They've been a, a Wisconsin cornerstone and an American, you know, economic powerhouse that people are like, yes, I have a Harley, very proud of that because it was built in the U.S. Jobs are going over there, you know, going overseas now as a result of it, which tells me that he hadn't thought out what he, he wanted to do. It's all about political gamesmanship. We're a few miles from the pro pro uh, proposed Foxconn campus. Mm -hmm. um, is that going to be a good deal for Southeast Wisconsin? I, uh, I, I'm leaning towards no from what I'm seeing right now. And, really? Um, I mean, what I have a problem with, and I think that's what we need to do right now, um, is make sure that they are held accountable. This is four and a half billion dollars of Wisconsin taxpayer money. Um, there were some, some laws in place that allowed us to ensure that Wisconsin taxpayers could benefit from them. Things like prevailing wage, uh, project labor agreements. Those have been stripped with these extreme Republicans that we have now in the state. So we can't use those to ensure that we have a, a certain percentage of minority participation from an area, which will help the service. I, I mean, especially with Racine being the number one or number two um, highest unemployment rate in the entire state. We, it swaps back between Racine and Beloit. Um, there's no insurances that people from, from Racine that need a job are going to be able to access those jobs. And it seems the number keeps getting decreased from what, what they're going to provide for everybody. Um, you know, and, and also I look at the roads that, that we have that are just crumbling. We can't pay, you know, and, and, and part of the Department of Transportation plan for Scott Walker was now he's saying we can't afford to fix all our roads, all these projects, so he's stretching them along, which is going to increase the cost of them. Um, but we found money to, to widen the lanes from the airport to where Foxconn's going to be, and these lanes aren't even going to use human drivers. It's going to be, they're going to be fully automated trucks. Foxconn doesn't have a good uh, history with as far as valuing their employees. Um, the, the other, their headquarters had suicide nets, so people don't jump off. Um, the CEO once referred to workers as animals. And another thing that I'm very concerned about is the environment. They're talking about removing protection so they can use millions of gallons from Lake Michigan. And Illinois is also talking about suing us because of the quality of air. So there's, there's a lot to be concerned about. And to use four and a half billion dollars of our taxpayer money when one of the first things Scott Walker did was take away almost one billion dollars from public education is, is one of his first steps, which was the largest axe to public education in the history of the state. Um, I, I'd prefer to see that money put on our infrastructure, on, on paying our teachers what they're worth, and, and taking care of public employees. Okay, you just referred to Act 10. Is that when you got involved in politics? It is. When I, I got heavily, I would say heavily involved in politics. Okay. Was seeing what was going on and the attack on, on working people in Wisconsin. Um, 
What did unions do wrong generally in the Act 10? Or what lessons have, have unions learned since Act 10? And uh, what did they do wrong? Well, we were, first of all, we were blindsided by Act 10. You, everybody you know, in the unions was blindsided. Walker himself referred to it as dropping the bomb. He never ran on, on you know, going after unions once elected. Um, but we saw that we were able to get big numbers together. It just, we weren't able, to, it didn't seem to be able to direct that energy um, in a way that, that actually got it to stop. But we, we learned that we could work with our legislators um, and, and there were a lot of really close relationships built to this day um, where, where I feel you know, very strongly we'll, we'll know ahead of time if a, a potentially very harmful bill is, is gonna be passed in front of the legislature. I'll get a phone call from a state rep saying, Randy, just thought you'd like a heads up on this so that we kind of like a war warning system has been built in place now. Um, and the numbers we saw that the divide and conquer that Scott Walker tried using, there were a lot less people showing up for the right to work fight um, but now we're learning new innovative ways as far as being able to organize. I mean, our, our campaign staff was the first to organize and um, so our, the people helping me run for office are union members. And we just saw the, the new Bucks Arena, um, the end user jobs for that. They guaranteed $15 an hour and, and a union is going to be, is, is already formed and they're going to have a hiring hall from that. So it's, although it's, it's harder for us to organize, um, just building that solidarity, solidarity up amongst each other and, and talking to each other, educating ourselves why we exist, what we've done, and the history of, of why we, you know, where we came from and how we came to be, letting our members know that. Should that $15 an hour be the national minimum wage? I'd like to see it be that. I mean, some places it could be higher. Um, New York City, it, the cost of living is a lot more there. Uh, but I say as a, as a basement level, that's where I'd like to see it. Some U.S. House Democrats, if they get the House in, uh, in November and take over in January, have said, we're going to begin in the impeachment process of, of Mr. Trump. Mm -hmm. If you're part of that new Democratic majority, would you be part of uh, the impeachment petition? I, de I definitely would be, um, would be talking about it. We'd definitely be discussing it. And I think we wouldn't have this problem right now if the Congress, the people, members of Congress right now would stand up to Donald Trump because it was meant to be part of the checks and balance when the country was founded. They're not doing that now, which I think is why you're hearing talk about, well, what else can we do? Um, the impeachment talk sounds you know, like a, a plan, but in reality, it's not gonna work if we don't have a majority in the Senate too. So it, it might sound good to say, let's do it in Congress. Um, I think he's done enough to be considered for impeachment um, but we have to make sure that it's something that's going to be successful. That we, so we, that's why this important is extremely important. When he said, when you say he's done enough, can you be specific? What what acts has he done? What orders has he issued that are grounds to begin the impeachment process? Well, if if we're talking about collusion with a, with a foreign government that helped get him elected, that he has knowledge about, um, I mean, and people have admitted guilt. People have been found guilty. Uh, people have have you know uh, taken immunity from the government. Um, I think it's very important to let the investigation finish up, to let Mueller's inf investigation finish up. That's the first thing we need to do. Okay. Um, the tax reform package boosted our federal deficit to beyond 21 trillion with a T. How big a problem is that deficit? It's a huge problem, especially when, when it's being caused by the Republicans who claim to be fiscally responsible. You know, and it's not just the fact of um, of having all this extra money, you know, that we don't have now, but they just gave $1.5 trillion to the richest people in the country. And now th that helped balloon the deficit up. So it's, it's showing us where their priorities are, and it's not helping working people. And what steps would you push for to control the deficit? Well, I think we need to look at, at wasteful spending. Um, that's, that's an issue. It's talking about, you know, like the military budget, for one, that is just unbelievable and the amount that we spend on, on military spending, um, comparing it with like the next seven or eight countries um, that are below us on that list, uh, things like that. And I think we, we ought to make sure that the people that can afford to pay their fair share do so. Do we need to address controlling the three entitlements, the Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid? Um, as far as, I think we need to exp actually expand those programs and, and you're gonna hear talk about, well, yes, it's gonna cost more, but I'm in favor of lifting the cap 
um, as far as on income, which is it would provide you know a lot more people, bring a lot more money in. Um, so you'd raise the what, one hundred twenty-five, hundred twenty-eight thousand? Correct. Okay, uh, that would be your way to help make Social Security more stable. Correct. The Trump administration, the president, have questioned how valid, um, how severe the climate change threat is. How severe is that threat? I, if you look at storms that we have today that, you know, compared to, to not too long ago, um, just a couple of degrees of, of temperature have made a huge difference. Um, Puerto Rico still doesn't have electricity in a lot of parts of the island. Um, it, it's a very real thing, you know, and I, and I believe in science and just as much as I believe, you know, when they're going to tell us there's an eclipse to go, it's going to happen. Science is real. It's, it's been proven and, and it's based in facts. Um, there are things we can do to help our environment and that's why I've been it's been very important for us. Um, I pushed to be in favor of using completely renewable energy by the year 2035. 2035. Yes. Uh, we need to end our dependence on fossil fuels. Um, solar energy is, is fantastic. Wind turbines, which Ironworkers Local 8, the union that I've been a member of for the past 20 years, we wrote the book on, on how to erect them. But since Walker took office and fossil fuel industry had to make, made a lot of contributions to their campaigns, we haven't been putting them up as a result. But our, still, our, our book is being used throughout the country on how to put them up. So it's, they're great paying jobs. And you hear often people are like, well, these are green jobs. They're not good paying jobs. And nothing could be further from the truth. I'm, I'm encouraging the building trades to grasp onto those, those t that type of work, to claim it for ourselves. Because if we don't, we're going to be watching other people with less skills putting the projects up. And, and we're going to be wondering, why aren't we doing this? Mass shootings, school shootings, do we need to change our gun laws? Absolutely. How? Absolutely do. Um, as a gun owner and a veteran, um, it's, it's a huge concern for me, and especially having an 11-year-old son that's going to school, um, just worrying about him. And, and parents shouldn't have to worry about their kids doing anything at school other than learning. I, I can't imagine what he would go through being having one of those active shooter drills, hiding under a desk. Um, but I also get the hunter culture that's huge in Wisconsin. And on a, when I'm on a job site, I love it when the, the people go hunting, they take off of work, because I get all the overtime hours then. Um, and, and then when they come back, there's always venison jerky to eat. So I don't have a problem with hunting, but I can tell you I'm not going to go out in the woods with them if they're going to have something with a bump stock. Um, or even, a, you know, when, one of the first things we were taught about when we were, before we were handed an M16 was the round. It was at 5.56 millimeter. And it's designed once it comes out of the barrel to tumble so that once it, it hits the target, it's going to bounce around and create as much damage as possible. Civilians don't need those weapons in you know, everyday use. Um, a shotgun, a pistol, those are, are fantastic for home defense. Um, but we also don't need, if you're hunting, you're going to get one, maybe two shots out in the woods. You, no reason for a, a high capacity magazine. And then those bump stocks, they don't add anything to, to the accuracy, and they're, they're just designed to, to get around from having a, a semi-automatic weapon um, you know, turn into a fully automatic weapon. Should background checks be extended to private Absolutely. sales? Absolutely. Um, we should make sure that only responsible people are able to, to purchase firearms, to include at gun shows as well, where that, that loophole seems to be in place. Um, and I also don't have a problem waiting for a couple of days. You know, if I want to buy a firearm, I don't have a problem waiting for a couple of days, so I'd, I'd be in favor of a cooling off period as well. Um, both U.S. House parties are talking about their future leaders. Mm -hmm. If you're a member of Congress in January, would you vote for uh, Nancy Pelosi as Speaker? I don't, I don't know who I'd, have, who I'd vote for. I know um, Representative Crowley was looking at being one of the, uh, the top challengers, so I don't know after he lost his primary who she would be up against. Um, I'm just really looking forward to being in a position to cast a vote for House leadership. Um, but right now, I don't know who would be challenging her. Um, some of your past incidents, incidences have recently come to light, and I, I just want to give you a chance to respond. When a Republican congressional spokesman says you're the Democratic candidate with the longest, his term, not mine, mm -hmm. rap sheet, uh, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. Oh, sure. I, I had an, an OUI 20 years ago in, in Upper Michigan. Um, and that resulted in some tickets down here. I, I couldn't make it up to the court date, couldn't get a ride to go up there. Um, and it was for driving after, you know, suspended license. Um, that resulted again from, from 20 year, an incident 20 years ago. 
Um, I don't try to justify it. I made a mistake. I, after work, I stopped at a tavern, had too, too many beers, and, and made a poor choice to get behind the wheel. Um, nobody was hurt. It's a mistake I learned from. Um, I'm, I'm not the same person I even was 20 years ago. You know, at that time, I, people are like, well, what's different? I was like, well, for one, after having the, the surgery for cancer, I was told I wouldn't be able to have a kid. 11 years ago, I, I had a son. And so, I've, you know, since I, I've had him, the couple of arrests that I've had, one was for um, a peaceful protest at Senator Ron Johnson's office in downtown Milwaukee, and the other was a sit-in down the street from Paul Ryan's office. So, yes, peaceful protesting is, is part of my rap sheet. Um, how did the dynamics of this race change when Mr. Ryan announced he, would, he was going to retire? For you? Well, um, for us, we got in very early, and the whole goal was to repeal and replace Paul Ryan with a working person. So we got the repeal part down, um, and now we have to work on replacing him. And it, it's not that it's any easier, it's, it's a different bit of a, you know, a pathway that we have to take, uh, but we're still determined to replace him with a, a working person. Senator Bernie Sanders has appeared with you. He's going to be soon appearing with you again. Mm -hmm. um, do you endorse his full platform, including, I think, free public uh, colleges, yes. tech colleges? Yes, I do. I do. Very, very similar. Um, I agree with him on, I, I can't think of anything I, I don't agree with him on. Okay. Um, final question. Um, I want to give you a chance to highlight differences between you and your opponent on August 14th. Okay. Um, but I've been here. I'm a lifelong resident of southeastern Wisconsin. Um, aside from the three years I, I spent enlisted in the Army, this is where I was born and raised. Um, this is where I beat cancer. I understand what it's like um, to have a disease, you know, a life-threatening disease like cancer without having any insurance. I, I know what the struggle's like of people here in this district. Um, and also, we've been able to put together something that the first district hasn't seen. It's, it's been just an incredible coalition. Um, you know, there were people that were considered Bernie people, people that were considered Hillary people. We've all combined that um, with the addition of labor as well. Every labor organization that's put forth an endorsement has chosen to get behind, get behind our campaign. Um, but, and, and David Obie, Congressman Obie, um, lifted the Obie rule that had been in place for so long after seeing what we had going on and got his endorsement um, and as well as the endorsement from Congresswoman Gwen Moore and Congressman Mark, Mark Bocan, who has just been a phenomenal, turned into a phenomenal mentor and ally, um, who's introduced me to a lot of other members of Congress too that have, you know, helped me. Because my first day, I'm not going to know every, everything that a congressperson needs, um, but I'll be very well prepared as a result of having made a friendship with Congressman Bocan and, and getting to meet other members of Congress. Uh, not every Democratic candidate for the U.S. House is the subject of a New Yorker and uh, <laughs> all this national PR. Has that helped you, or did you get that too early in the campaign? Well, it, the thing is, is that it helped us because it was a, a nationalized race. Paul Ryan was the Speaker of the House, the number three most powerful Republican in the country. And he affected all the legislation that was going to be brought forth, discussed, voted on. Um, it went through him. So we got a lot of support from people that wanted to replace him. Um, and But we, we've been able to build up a very solid within a district. We have over... 100 county captains, um, and, and it's been very localized now, and just the enthusiasm in the first district has been really quite phenomenal. I just want to give you a chance to respond. When we interviewed uh, your opponent, Kathy Myers, she said one difference is you, she doesn't think you've always been pro-choice. Do you want to respond to that? Have you always been pro-choice on women's, I, women's I've, health Yeah, I, I'm always in favor of, of uh, women having the ability to choose um, for themselves what happens with their body. and. I'm very proud to have the endorsement of NARAL Pro-Choice America as well. We sat down and, and talked about exactly where I stood, um, and they felt confident enough that they gave me their endorsement. Randy, thank you. Randy Bryce of Caledonia is a Democrat running in the 1st Congressional District. The primary is August 14th. Campaign 2018 is sponsored by Wisconsin Hospital Association, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Realtors Association, Marshfield Clinic Health System, and Campaign 2018 partner Milwaukee Journal Sentinel.